app. White House National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow this morning said the White House is, quote, for the moment, standing by Herman Cain to serve on the Federal Reserve Board. His remarks came in an interview with Bob Cusack of the Hill newspaper. and helicopters <laughs> in several cities selling pipelines. Pipelines, right? Pipelines, right. Well, thank you for, for being with us, Director Cudlow. Anyone who has back pain knows uh, how painful it is, so we really appreciate it. Yeah, and hopefully that pillow will help you. Um, uh, so we're here to talk about the tax cuts, the, the economy, and by all figures, really, uh, most figures, certainly. The economy is humming. Yeah. Uh, will it continue into 29, uh, the rest of the year and into 2020? Because there's a lot of fear, as you know, <clears throat> critics have said, maybe there's a recession coming. But the last jobs report was very, very positive. Yeah, well, you're, uh, you're right. That was a good number. I don't, I don't see any recession okay. um, this year or next year. Uh, I'll say a couple things on this point, a lot of people have misunderstood or, you know, just don't agree or philosophical differences regarding economic analysis and economic modeling. Uh, I know there's this idea that 2018 was a good year because we got 3% growth, but it's a sugar high. That's all going to go away. Mm -hmm. But I want to um, rebut that. What we've done is, is not a kind of one-time, you know, tax rebate. I can't see you over there. So we can move that. Uh, or maybe I can move up. This is not a one-time cash tax rebate kind of thing, and it just goes away. What we did was we lowered marginal tax rates, particularly on the business side, large and small companies. Mm -hmm. And th this was the bulk of the plan. Now, there are individual tax cuts, and some of those were rate reductions, and some of them weren't. But the heart of it is on the business side and lowering the corporate rate from, uh, as you know, 35 to 21 percent, 100 percent expensing uh, new international rules. We went territorial, so you don't have to get double tax on your overseas profits. So from my lights, as a supply sider, the argument has been we are creating incentives, right? So you, you, at the margin, you keep more of what you earn on the extra hour work, the extra dollar invested, uh, the extra investment risk dollar. And those incentives will be in place for a long time. Now, if I get this right, the expensing, the 100% expensing, which is very important, uh, is, I think, uh, if, uh, another five years, if I'm not mistaken. The corporate tax rate reduction is permanent, you know, quote unquote, but it is uh, permanent. Uh, ditto for the, um, for the territorial uh, treatment of uh, overseas profits. So what am I saying? I'm saying that these incentives uh, designed to rebuild the economy, we, we haven't had good we haven't had good capital investment, capital stock. We haven't had productivity. We haven't had real wage increases. These are designed to be maintained for many years to come, literally as far as the eye can see. And so therefore, I, I don't, you know, it doesn't end, it continues. Uh -huh. And a point I want to make, um, a lot of the larger companies are really probably going to produce more investment uh, by which I mean uh, capital goods, uh, intellectual property, which is really booming right now, um, for years. I mean, unless and until these tax, these lower tax rates are repealed, and we will certainly don't expect that. 
such a thing would never happen in the Senate, but if it did, the president would veto it. We expect these to go on for a long time, and these bigger companies, I think, are just beginning to adjust their investment horizons uh, to take advantage of the new tax incentives. Mm -hmm. You follow me there? The, the, those big ships take a while to turn around. Smaller companies can move faster, and that's a big source of job creation. And you know the numbers there from the NFIB are very, very strong, so I like that. We're also seeing, um, as part of this, a um, tremendous increase in new business applications and uh, new business formations, mm -hmm. which is very important. We all say that small businesses are the biggest job creators in the economy. Uh, that's true up to a point, but actually it's the brand new businesses that really are the biggest job creators. So what I'm saying is the tax incentives stay in place, the lower marginal rates stay in place, and consequently, unless there's some massive exogenous shock, I don't see why the economy can't continue to grow at um, you know our three percent uh, baseline. With the with the economy strong and unemployment uh, at rate uh, lowest in in five decades, wh why did why did Republicans lose the House then? With the economy strong, was it a messaging issue with the tax cuts? Did some Republicans stop talking about the tax cuts down the stretch of the election? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, look, I am uh, not a political analyst per se. Uh, there's uh, many reasons for what happened, other issues, midterm elections. I, it's very hard for me to know. I'm interested, though, in the polling on this, where s many of the polls I've seen show um, positive uh, you know, approval of economic conditions or the president's economic policies. You know, those numbers are up in the high 50s, low 60s. Uh -huh. Those are big numbers. And I think people are aware. Now, some people would say, well, the, the tax cuts per se don't seem to poll well. I, I don't know if that's true. I'm not a polling expert. But the results are definitely polling well. As you noted, the uh, employment way up, unemployment way down. And I want to add one other point on this, uh, Bob. That is, we believed, this is my dear friend and colleague Kevin Hassett and I and, and others who uh, worked on this uh, plan way back almost three years ago, um, that a new, a new economic theory, I, I, I won't say brand new, but it was controversial, lowering business tax rates would help um, middle income, lower middle income workforce uh -huh. the most, the most. Um, I, I don't know what the right phraseology is, and I'm not doing as well as I'd like to do normally for early morning with the Hill, but uh, what I'll say is blue collars, Main Street, ordinary working folks have actually outperformed quite a bit. You know, when you look at the wage numbers, the rate of increase for the non-supervisory workers, okay, is way ahead of the supervisory workers. So I just think of it as blue collar, white collar. That is a little simplistic, I know, but uh, it's really very interesting. And I brought some numbers with me on this because I, I just love this stuff. Um, uh, average weekly earnings for workers rose 3.3 percent, which itself is a terrific number. Um, supervisors rose 2.6 percent, okay. It's pretty good, but in uh, the two years ending, uh, the two years since uh, 2016, the average weekly earnings of workers rose 7.4 percent. All right, so it's much bigger than the overall number. For supervisors, 5.9 percent. So what I'm calling the ordinary workers, I don't mean that as demeaning, I'm just saying the non-managers are doing better than the managers uh -huh. are doing. And this was a, an idea that we had looked at. It was controversial. I, I reckon it's still somewhat controversial. But they're the ones who get help the more. Why is this? Because we the last 20 years, we've been short capital stock. We've been short business investment. We've been short productivity. And we've been short real wages. That seems to be turning around. 
And I know, you know, a couple of years is, doesn't necessarily uh, clinch that, and we will, you know, wait to see more evidence as the data comes in. But that was our point. And we are seeing, you know, the productivity numbers are up, uh, thankfully, 1.8% last year. Uh, and again, uh -huh. I know it's just a year, so I appreciate any skepticism, but it's a good, it's a good move. Uh, the increase in cap goods and intellectual property is doing well, and real wages are doing well. So at the moment, I would argue these, the supply side model is working, the incentives are working, and as long as they are in place, there's no reason why the overall economy can't continue to grow. What about uh, on trade? Uh, everyone has been waiting for a trade deal with China. Are we going to get one? Are you confident that this spring there will be a deal with China? Well, confident. That's, um, what are the chances? I'm the happy warrior. Uh, I'm going to play it from the um, optimistic side. Uh, as you've seen in quotations, uh, Secretary of the Treasury was out yesterday sounding optimistic. Uh, the President's been optimistic. Uh, my dear friend Bob Lighthizer has been guardedly optimistic. Um, Bob Lighthizer is the, the best trade attorney, the, the best trade negotiator I've ever seen. And he, he and I are antiques, we're relics from the Reagan years. I love that. And Bolton and Lighthizer and I are like Reagan antiques. We worked 35 some odd years ago. I was 13 years old, I think, when <laughs> I, was the, I was the associate director of OMB. Um, but you've, have you seen progress? In yeah. We've made good progress. I mean, that's, I, I don't want to predict, look, it's tricky business. It's got to be a great deal. You've heard the president say that. It's got to be, it's got to be the great deal. It's got to be the right deal. It's got to be an enforceable deal. Uh -huh. And it has to cover the structural issues on technology and IP and, um, and cyber hacking. And then, of course, the commodities, the tariffs and non-tariffs. We have made enormous progress. Uh, we continued that progress last week when they were here. They've been on tele, uh, teleconferencing uh, this week. That's already Thursday. Yeah, they've been teleconferencing. They continue to make progress. Uh, I can't say the deal is done. It's not done. There are uh, things that need to be covered. Um, so am I confident? Well, I would just say that, you know, I'm going to play this from the optimistic side, but there are issues that still have to be done. Do you think, I mean, the economy, where it can go from here, uh, a lot of people say if there is a deal with China, then the economy would really take off. I mean, what is the limit? I mean, could, I know it's not the only economic uh, indicator, but could the Dow hit 30,000? What, what, what is the ceiling here? Well, look, you're asking me. Um, I'm the happy warrior. You know, I, I think America has unlimited potential. I always have, I still do. My, you know, my model, uh, sort of my intellectual model, is when you know, free market forces rule the roost, when incentives to work, save, and invest are in place, when the dollar is steady, the inflation rate is low. Uh, I, I think it's unlimited. Look, from the end of World War II to the year 2000, I believe the baseline here is 1947 when the statistics were in place. Uh, USA grew at 3.5% a year after inflation. It's a tremendous performance, un unparalleled. And we hit a slump for whatever reasons in the last um, 16, 18 years since 2000, no question. We hit a slump with Democrats and Republicans in charge. I think we can get back to that 3.5% long-term trend line. You know, the president talks about getting to 4, 4.5%. I don't see why not. I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not a believer in secular stagnation. I don't think there's anything, there's no categorical imperatives uh, with the right policies for, for, again, free markets and the creating of opportunities for everybody. I don't see why we can't continue. I understand, you know, over time the business cycle will produce uh, uh, its own uh, booms and busts, but really, I think we can get back to that long-term trend line. That's one of our goals, and I think it's an across-the-board goal. So I'm always optimistic, 
Look, the United States, we are a free market economy. The government doesn't run the economy in this country. Maybe we can talk about uh, Green New Deals and socialism, one of my favorite topics to talk about. But um, it's individual men and women operating in the economy, using their God-given talents to be entrepreneurs, to be great workers, inventors, as long as we give them the freedom to produce, I believe we, our future is unlimited, absolutely unlimited. I'm the quintessential optimist. I learned it from Ronald Reagan 35 years ago, and I'm still there. Uh, do you think that the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is doing a good job? Um, I do. Um, I know we've had some discussions about that uh, in recent weeks. I think the... Um, discussions with him? We've just had a lot of discussions. It's been very exciting. <laughs> Tell uh, us about those discussions. I started my career at the Federal Reserve. That's uh -huh. a little known factoid. So, so I was 13 when I was at OMB, so I, I don't remember how old I was at the New York Fed in 1973, freshly minted Princeton grad student person. Um, so I have a long history with the Fed. Look. It's obviously well known that the president uh, did not agree, does not agree with the last couple of rate hikes. Uh, I agree with the president on this. I, I thought that they were unnecessary. Now, I, again, the Fed is an independent central bank, and um, we aim to keep it that way. All right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we can't express our opinions periodically. The president himself is a very well-informed investor and businessman. I have views, we all have views, so as I've said before, I wouldn't mind when the Fed is ready, I wouldn't mind uh, seeing them lower the target rate, uh, 50 basis points or so, in line with the falling inflation rate, by the way. Now having said that, uh, with regard to Jay Powell, who is a friend, um, I think he's a fine person, I think he's uh, going to turn into a good Fed chairman. Um, speaking personally, he has my confidence, and uh, we have some great. Rich Clarida is the vice chairman. He's a very old friend of mine. I think he's a brilliant, brilliant guy, and I think they will work well. As I say, we wish they hadn't raised. Um, I noticed from the various reports and uh, so forth that um, they've changed their view. I don't think rates will rise in the foreseeable future, maybe never again in my lifetime. Whether they will fall, I, I wouldn't mind them falling. I'm not storming the ramparts. I, I, again, if that is independent, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, along those lines, we've I'm not sure there are. I'm not sure the differences between the Fed's worldview and our worldview are as big as they are sometimes portrayed. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll just make okay. that statement. That's fair. Um, we've talked to some Republicans who say that Herman Cain cannot get the votes uh, to serve on the Fed board. Uh, is the administration standing behind Herman Cain? Yes, we are at the moment. Um, at the moment? At the moment, that's right. Uh, he's in the vetting process, is what I'm saying. Because his going, paperwork has not yet gone. That's not, his paperwork is in. Uh, he's being looked at by the FBI. As to the a, Senate, I mean. Uh, he's that, not been uh, that's correct. Yes. It, it will. And, okay. Uh, so you plan on moving forward with that? Um, we, it, it, we have to start internally at the White House. That process is going on. And um, as the president said yesterday, he continues to support it. And we will see how that turns out. I don't want to prejudge it one way or the other. We will be in, uh, we have already, in fact, started consultations with the Senate Banking Committee. Senator Crapo, who's a good man, a friend of mine, um, they will go through their own process. I don't want to prejudge it. I know there are things about and allegations and so forth. Um, this town is. Um, full of allegations. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're completely untrue, as we've seen. I want to give him, uh, Herman, a you know, decent chance to go through that process. Is the vetting process encompassing the allegations from the four women? Could that stop him internally? I, I would just say when the FBI vets, they vet pretty good. Okay. Kind of. They vet very well. Um, they vetted me. Jeez. You got through. I've been vetted a couple times down through the year. Well, you know, my ex-wife and I get along. <laughs> I pay my taxes. 
I've been married 32 years, haven't had a drink in 25 years, life is good, it's all <laughs> grace. Uh, you know, I, I don't, these things, um, you know, we'll see. I, I, all I'm saying is, uh, he's in the process, we'll let him go through it, and the president insists on that. Mm -hmm. And um, as it, late last night, we got off Marine One, uh, a landing here from Texas. Um, president said he stands, he continues to stand behind Mr. Cain. And we will be consulting with the Senate Banking Committee. They will do their own vetting. And the, you know, let's, I, my goal here as NEC director is to just make sure these processes are going fine. Many corporations are raising their minimum wage. Is it time for the federal government uh, the federal minimum wage to be increased. Democrats are, are going to be pushing that legislation. I love it when companies w raise their minimum wage. Love it. Love, love, love. Mm -hmm. Really. That's the best way to do it. I, <clears throat> I don't want the federal government to do it. I've never understood how the federal government can fiddle with minimum wages and other related uh, regulations just because, you know, cost of living is different in different parts of the country. The cost of living in Idaho is different than it is in New York or Washington, D.C. And that's one of the reasons, I have other reasons, but one of the reasons I don't like minimum wages. But when you're in a prosperous, good, strong growth period, like we are now, these companies are raising their minimum wages. It's fantastic. Right. Fantastic. And it lets me come back to another point. Uh, it's kind of a Fed point, but it's also a generic point on, on, on macroeconomic policy. Um, more people working at higher wages, first of all, is a good thing, not a bad thing. Second of all, it doesn't cause inflation. And that is maybe an e econometric, philosophical difference that we may have with uh, some of these other big economic models. Um, right now, workers, as we went through these numbers a few moments ago, even the middle and low end workers are the most successful workers, getting the biggest wage increases. They're earning it through higher productivity. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's a fabulous thing, actually. And therefore, if I don't remember who was in the paper this morning raising the $15, as somebody was in the paper this morning, I think uh, before that it was Amazon, before that, I, I love that. Yeah. I, I, want all these, I don't want to order them or mandate the companies to do it. They're doing it because the economy is booming. That's the best way to do it. And they're doing it as individual, privately owned companies. It's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And I'll see more of it. Bet you we will see more of it. One thing that has not been... I'd like my minimum wage <laughs> go up. One, one economic indicator that has been bad news recently, and you were very critical of the deficit and the debt levels in the Obama administration. We got a new number, $691 billion uh, deficit in the first half of the fiscal year. We're looking at trillion-dollar deficits. Democrats say... A big part of that, or at least some part of it, is the tax cuts. Are the tax cuts paying for themselves? Yes. Un some experts say absolutely not. And they always will. They always will. But no, we're talking about nonpartisan experts here who have said that it I, has blown I, a hole in the deficit. I have to process that nonpartisan expert <laughs> part. Um, I'll think about that. Okay. But look, uh, interestingly, I just saw... Uh, February, March, year on year, the federal revenues are coming in uh, when you adjust for a, 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 a day short in March or a day short in February, about 9%. It's a good number. Revenues are really coming in nicely. Uh, I believe what will happen here is as a share of GDP, which is I really think you have to look at these things in relation to the economy, you will see the deficit on a steady glide path lower. Uh, same for the overall publicly held debt. Uh, I think that if you look at the adjustments, um, let's let's take a nonpartisan CBO. Uh -huh. I'm going to call them nonpartisan this morning. Um, 
Their own numbers show pre-tax cut, post-tax cut, all right? Um, they raised the level of nominal GDP, which is your right. national income revenue number, uh, quite a lot, if my memory serves me, and I, I'm not doing so great this morning, but it's about $7 trillion. More, more give, give me some elbow room on that for a wounded warrior after a bad day. Um, that, you know, at an average tax rate of 17, 17.5% has produced something around 1.2 something trillion extra dollars that generated from the increase in nominal GDP. And the tax cut, as you recall, was estimated at 1.4, 1.5 trillion. So yes, I think we have already paid for a good chunk of it. Our numbers show the same thing uh, in, in the uh, Office of Management budget. And I think we're right on target. Uh, give us some time. You know, I never argued in year one it would pay for itself. The Laffer curve doesn't suggest that. But after a couple of years, I believe it will, and then some. And I think we've gotten off to a very good start. I do believe we have to seek limited government. Uh, we have a tough budget, um, which we are lowering domestic accounts uh, by more or less 5% across the board. The president has indicated if the spending caps uh, going all the way back to the 2011 deal uh, are not met, then we will sequester across the board, both defense and non-defense, uh, excluding entitlements. But we will run by those rules. That's tough stuff. I think it's appropriate. Uh, I'm reading in the paper that the, um, uh, some people in the Congress want to raise spending uh, on both uh, domestic and military. I don't think we can do that. I, I've always been a limited government guy. I think the key here is growth, 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 growth. That's the ultimate solution. But I think you have to really uh, try to run an efficient government full of reforms. And uh, uh, are we doing that? I, well, we're trying to do that. We're working in that direction. So I, I kind of like what we're doing. I don't think our budget position is near as bad as many people say it is. We uh, turn to one of your, as you said, favorite topics, uh, socialism. You've called on Republicans to put socialism on trial. Mm -hmm. um, if Democrats win back Congress and the White House in 2020, what happens to the economy? Well, look, I will say this. Uh, socialism is highly centrally planned collectivist policies does not work with all due respect to those people who are talking. Um, we, we shouldn't forget the Soviet Union. We should have a look at Venezuela. Let's look at history. Centrally planned, collectivist, you, these kinds of political economic models, they are despotic, they are tyrannical, they impoverish. Look at the economic performance. I don't want to forget that. I, I want to have this conversation. I like this conversation a lot. Um, yesterday, uh, or the day before, Senator Sanders put out his, um, his uh, health care plan, uh, universal Medicare, it's essentially government takeover. Um, I know Mr. Sanders a bit. He was a guest on my TV show years ago. Uh -huh. um, I respect his views. I just completely disagree. I think I want, not only would it be so costly, I mean, the estimates tend to run around $30 trillion some odd from both center left and center right think tanks which is an extreme, and that's inside 10 years. But the number that sticks in my craw on that is that 180 million, 180 million people with private health care plans would lose it. That is extraordinary. And that is endemic to the socialist model where the government takes over everything. But where, where's the Republican health care plan? I believe it would be catastrophic. I believe it would be catastrophic. Uh, I do not believe that, and I believe it would, well, let me add the Green New Deal, 
And the idea of, again, financing um, anybody who doesn't want to work, no regulations, uh, all of that would decimate the economy. I, I think you'd lose 15% of GDP, Bob inside of 10 years. 15% of GDP is the number we've noodled with. Is that with. specific to Green New Deal or are you combining? Combining. Some aspects of the Green New Deal include the universal Medicare, some Medicare don't. For all, right. But we've looked at these numbers up and down. I know they're imprecise. I know some of the, blue, uh, some of the policy statements are not as detailed as they would have to be. But we're looking at a loss of 15% of GDP inside of 10 years. That is remarkable. We, we, that would destroy this country's economy. And our freedoms would be destroyed. Our incentives would be destroyed. Our morale would be destroyed. I mean, there's nothing more demoralizing, nothing more demoralizing to individual men and women uh, than having the government absolutely run everything inside the economy, which will lead, by the way, to a curtailment of political liberties as well. I, I just want to make that very clear. I want to have this discussion. Um, I think it's very important. Um, well, I look at polls, by the way. It's funny, coming in here. The, the polling is it's so interesting. People say, well, the country likes socialism. No, it doesn't. I was looking at my pal, longtime friend from AI, Caroline, Carolyn Bowman, who was tracking, uh, if I can find it, tracking Gallup polls, uh -huh. you know, asking the same question uh, year in and year out. Maybe I don't have it here. But anyway, by about two to one, people oppose socialism. That's really what it comes down to. That hasn't changed very much down through the years. So the impact on the economy and our liberty would be devastating. And I go back again, uh, one of my historical idols, uh, you know, I'm so old, I used to have breakfast with him periodically, but not for a while. Winston Churchill talked to a lot. Uh, Churchill argued, said, um, if you're not a socialist in your 20s, you have no heart. And if you're not a capitalist in your 30s, you have no mind. And the reason I say that is I personally want to talk to the younger group, the millennials. I know I'm an old guy. I want to try to give them the benefit of some experience and some history. And they are in the workforce now, and they are matriculating through their careers. And I believe they will discover that there's no, you know, the idea of central planning doesn't work. And um, it would be devastating to the economy, devastating to Couple, the economy. Well, along those lines, uh, do you think the Democratic House, which has been in power for a few months now, is holding back or hampering the economy? Um, and, and Part B, do you think that they will uh, approve of the new NAFTA, the yeah. USMCA? You think the House will? Well, pass look at I, I think Speaker, not a lot of movement on that so far. Uh, well, yes and no. Look, I, I think Speaker Pelosi has been very accommodative to us, frankly. Um, uh, Bob, Le she has uh, opened the door. Bob Lighthizer has addressed the Democratic conference, uh -huh. which is a, a very a, you know, very positive thing, um, and I think she's looking at it. Um, Ms. Pelosi has voted for many trade deals down through the years, so I'm not going to prejudge that. By the way, I haven't seen her in a bit since I took office here, but she was a guest on the Cudlow Report um, several times down through the years. So I, I, I believe, and I'm not a political expert, I think if uh, you know, she will determine the vote. I think we will get a vote on USMCA. And this, this year, you think? I believe we will. This is just my right. view. You're uh, on the inside. And I think um, if we get a vote, we have an excellent chance of passing that vote. I want to put a plug in, Bob, for USMCA, because I know we've talked a lot about China. But right. USMCA is a very important trade deal. And it's also a very good trade deal. And here you have not only, I think, a better distribution with respect to domestic content of manufacturing, particularly automobiles, uh, and, some, uh, and some wage adjustments, very important, and some farming adjustments. Uh, we had some good breakthroughs on the dairy farm issue with uh, our neighbors to the north. But also, the new economy stuff, which has gotten short shrift, is very, very positive, uh, much stronger uh, intellectual property protections, which is so vital to 
entrepreneurship and investment, so vital. Um, expansion of digital services, expansion of financial services, expansion of biologics, and so forth and so on. I love the new economy stuff. I like the old economy stuff. I think it's very pro-growth, and that's why I, want to, I try to push it wherever I go. Um, and I think we have a very decent chance. Again, I think the speaker's been, been even-handed on this. You know, it's interesting, just as a sidelight, if you'll permit me, a lot of people have criticized the Trump administration for being anti-trade or whatever. And actually, you know, as we sit here this morning, uh, we have a decent chance of a historic China trade deal. You know, I'm, as I say, somewhat optimistic on that. We have a very good chance of a historic renewal of the uh, you know, NAFTA 2.0, USMCA. We are negotiating with Europe. We are negotiating with Japan. We passed a very good South Korean free trade deal. Uh, you know, I think that the president's trade reform, you know, we've been you know, free, fair, and reciprocal trade has been his model. Zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, zero subsidies has been his model. I allows a free trader like myself to work with him and support it. I think it's working rather well. A lot of people are skeptical. We're doing pretty well when you think about it, particularly in the last <clears throat> year or so. And I, I will say this uh, amidst controversy. One thing he's taught me is some, sometimes tariffs can be very effective negotiating tools. As leverage. As leverage, yeah. yes, sir. I mean, it's interesting. And he has been tougher, especially on China, than anybody in either party in the last uh, several decades. So I'm just saying that I'm going to regard the trade story as potentially very pro-growth if we get these. Now, I, I can't guarantee. I don't want to get ahead of that curve. But frankly, I, I think it's a pretty good story. We, we have had a number of questions that have come in through social media and other means. Uh, Andrew Louts asked a question. I do want to get at least one of these in. What is the White House doing to provide more certainty to both investors in opportunity funds uh, relating to opportunity zones? Oh, well, uh, we're launching. We're launching. We're pretty much finished with the, regu with the regs. Uh, this is a really as part of our supply side tax incentives. You know, this goes back, um, one of my mentors down through the years, and very, very dear friends, the late uh, Jack Kemp. This comes out of that. And it basically, through, uh, again, lower tax rate incentives, it basically is designed to promote a lot of investment, capital, private capital investment, in areas, uh, you know, poverty areas around the country. I, I don't. It's going to cover a lot of areas, Bob. I don't know. I don't have the number in my head, so I don't want to put fall. But it's going to cover a lot, a lot of areas. Um, I mean, I, I think the number will be in the thousands when it's all said and done. Uh, you know, hats off to HUD Secretary Ben Carson for pushing this. Um, he's got, a, we, I'm part of that group in the, in the administration that's working on this. We have added uh, not only the tax incentives, but we've added a piece on education reform, job training reform, things of that sort that, that can go along with it. Um, security and safety also. I think it's a fabulous idea. I think it's a great way to try to broaden the base of prosperity. The way I look at that is that, um, I think I said this in cabinet the other day, you know, for, for me, I want every nook and cranny of America to share in the prosperity. But I don't believe, and judging from the experience of the past many decades, that government can do that. Uh, and I do believe we should try the private investment capital route, uh, and again, uh, helped by 
these other reform areas, as I said, in education, particularly in job trading. And I, I, think, I think it's a very big deal. I think it's kind of underrated. Anyway, the, the final product will be out soon, very, very soon. And I think it will prove to be a great success. I think you're going to see a lot of movement of capital into these areas. As you know, we're going into, we're already in really the political season, but going into 2020. Uh, is the administration and the president and you and others going to be asking that quintessential question for four more years, are you better off than you were four years ago? I think we'll be happy to ask that. Is that going to be the number one issue? Is the economy going to be the number one issue in 2020 from, the, from, from your side? Well, look, I, it's a political strategy. The economy is going to be very key. It's going to be very, very key. It always is. You know, presidential elections, peace and prosperity tend to be uh, historic themes. Um, I think um, we are proud of our record on the economy. And as I said, the prosperity that's developing, which I think is going to broaden and, and strengthen. So that's going to be crucial, absolutely crucial. We're proud of our record on jobs and wages. Uh, but we are proud of our record on trade. And I know the president is fighting hard and will continue to fight hard uh, for various security issues, international security. That includes border security. It will include the wall and the reforms that he wants. I think that, you know, I think border security is really part of economic security down there. I think uh, I'm not going to go through the foreign policy side, but the president has made significant reforms in our foreign policy that I believe are working. And um, that will be a subject of great discussion, as you might guess. Um, I think on some of the social issues, as you know, he's a strong pro-lifer. I am too. I think that will be part of the discussion. So we can review a whole bunch of issues. But to your point, absolutely, the economy will be central. It always is. It should be. And um, we are proud of our record. And I'm sure he will be quite happy to run. He's a growth president. He's a growth president. Growth, I mean, we were kidding. Last night, we were coming home and the final leg on Marine One, and we were doing our little growth routine. Sir, growth. Yes, growth, growth, growth. I, I want to even get a little pipeline. You didn't get it. It kind of it broke my back <laughs> yesterday. I was wondering. Uh, our executive order on expanding, you know, we've become number one energy producer in the world, which is a remarkable thing. Um, we're just trying to now, you know, down in the Permian Basin, I think if the Permian Basin was a country or something, I think it would be the uh, fifth or sixth largest gas producer or oil producer or both producers, uh -huh. I don't know, whatever, maybe the largest. Anyway, the, 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 the price of that gas in the Permian is close to zero. They're, they're producing so much, they have excess, they have to burn it, flare it to get rid of it, but that's no good. The reason they do that is there aren't enough pipeline capacity. You, you can pipe a lot of it south to the Gulf, but we need to pipe it to the East Coast and the Northeast so they don't have to buy Russian gas and fuel it. At New York and New England, they're buying a lot of stuff from Russia. I don't want that. And then we want to pipe it west. We can sell it uh, to Asia and to Europe. We can undermine Russia. I don't believe Russia should be the dominant oil uh, and gas producer in Europe. That's not necessary. We are highly competitive, so we're making some deregulatory changes. I haven't spent enough time this morning on our rollback of regulations, which I think is incredibly important to the growth of the economy across the board. I, want, I, I apologize for that. Um, and the pipeline initiative and the new terminals and refineries that go along with it, uh, we want a more reasonable regulatory structure that will allow us, you know, to bring much cheaper fuel uh, to key parts of the country, like the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast and New England, and also to Europe. This is big stuff, really big stuff. And one other thing, I, part, I'm not all together this morning, but on this regulatory stuff, I want to go back, you know, you asked me very early in the game about the economy and businesses. 
The small business explosion and the explosion of um, uh, net new business formations, uh -huh. I believe, is a direct result of the regulatory rollback. You know, it's, uh, I saw this during the Reagan years, that um, if you make it easier, it's, it's paperwork, but it's also some of these um, other regulations that go too far. I'm not against regulations, but I am against extreme regulations. You know, you're seeing this whole new generation of people, men and women of all stripes, races and so forth, um, exploding this new business story. And I think that has a lot to do with the tax cuts, but it has a lot to do with the regulatory rollback. Anyway, we're selling pipeline down in Texas yesterday. It was wonderful. Uh, you just have to kind of love that. Hard hats, you know, people in pipes, and these metal constructs. God, I just, I'm a city boy, so it's, you know, love to watch that stuff. It was great. And the fact that I can't walk is um, just something we'll deal with later. <laughs> well, uh, we have run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, especially with your back plane. Please thank Director Cudlow for joining us. I hand it back to Jack. Want me to carry that? Well, I can carry that. Tonight on the C-SPAN Networks, some of today's hearings 